Johnny Mac with your daily comedy news. Al Franken guest hosted for Jimmy Kimmel and said some are saying Trump could be a flight risk, which is crazy. But the good news is at least Trump's official presidential portrait is back up at every airport. <laughs> you know, there's never been a better time to visit Palm Beach because for the rest of the summer, Mar-a-Lago is running a special weekend getaway package that includes free breakfast, a room upgrade where available, and a nuclear secret of your choosing. Jimmy Fallon got in on the climate bill and said right after he signed the bill, President Biden was like, what are those strange sounds? And a staffer was like, that's applause, sir. Trump heard and was like, you'll definitely want to sneak that one home when you leave office. And Trevor Noah joked about Europe's drought, saying it's so bad you can walk across some rivers, which isn't just bad for the environment or the economy. It also puts people like Moses out of a job. I watched Tim Dillon's special on Netflix. Uh, Yeah, you hear it in my voice already. I like Tim's podcast a lot. Not so much when he has guests on. The last two episodes of his podcast, he's had serious guests on for some reason. I like when Tim just kind of riffs and is making fun of conservative talk show hosts. I heard Tim speak in the past about growing up in Long Island and listening to folks like Bob Grant. So I see what he's doing there on the pod, and I enjoy it a lot. So I was really psyched for the special It immediately took me out of it that the sound is bad. And I Googled Tim Dillon crowd to make sure I wasn't crazy. And a couple other people said it. The crowd mix is too hot. Now, I don't think it's fake crowd the way I suspect that Ricky Gervais's last special might add some fake crowd. But it's mixed too hot, which makes it sound like a laugh track. Meaning a joke can be perfectly fine, but you don't need the audience erupting in laughter. It's clearly not that level of joke. Also, Tim himself has some echo slapback. So I don't know who recorded this. There's definitely better audio to be had. So the sound mix took me out of it. It took me about 10 minutes to get back into it. There are definitely some really good jokes in there. But as I was watching, I'm like, I'm finding this special fatiguing. And then I finally figured it out. Tim does not modulate his voice. The entire 45 minutes, he's telling the jokes at this delivery, at this cadence. Here's the punchline. And it never varies from that. There's no speed. He doesn't go up and down. So think in your mind of somebody like George Carlin or Dave Chappelle in the modern days. Dave will completely stop and let you take in what he said. He'll go quiet. He'll make a point. And then he'll do the rat-a-tat-tat one-liners just to kind of shake your energy up a little bit. And that's a good way to approach things. I've talked in the past how George Carlin's manager, Jerry Hamza, explained to me that Carlin would do that and that Carlin believed you couldn't stay at just one speed the entire time, which is why he'd open with rat-a-tat-tat and then do a longer middle section where you had to think a little bit. But Tim, and I liked him, but everything was just like, and now I'm going to tell you another joke. Here's a punchline, okay? Very fatiguing. So let me know if you watched it. Uh, I don't know. I haven't added it to my end of the year best of. We'll see. The Beat caught up with Shane Gillis. And they asked Shane, how do you feel about watching other comedians bomb? Shane Gillis said, I love it. (laughs) As a comedian, there's nothing better than watching one of your friends bomb. Because if they're a good enough comedian, they know it's funny. If I could tell somebody what it was really like bombing and having a bad time, I wouldn't be laughing at them. But if one of my friends tells a joke and it doesn't work and I'm in the room, I'm going to laugh loud so they hear me. Shane, do you have any good heckler stories? The first show I ever did, I was bombing so bad. In the middle of my set, I told one joke. This guy in the front, he didn't even say it to me. He said it to his friend. It was so quiet I could hear. It was like, that one wasn't so bad. I was just crushed. Just some dude with his arms crossed sitting there with his friend. So that one wasn't bad. It was rough. Does Shane Gillis feel heckling has a place in comedy? No, I don't. I hate it. Someone will say something and be talking the whole time. You get done with the show and they're like, hey, I was helping, you know? No, you weren't. If someone's doing crowd work and they start effing with you, yeah, you have every right to defend yourself. But if I'm on stage and just out of nowhere, someone's like, that joke sucked or something, that sucks. I was in Tacoma and this girl was in the front row. She was hot and out of nowhere, she started giving it to me. She was mad. I could tell she was mad. And I was like, are you all right? And she was like, F you. And I was like, all right, what happened? And she was like, this is misogynistic and racist and F you. And she left. And, you know, the crowd started booing her. I'm like, don't boo her. She's allowed to say that. Whatever. She left, but her boyfriend stayed. So it was like, bro. That's tough. He was enjoying the show and he was like, I'm sorry. And I was like, don't worry. She's hot. You're doing all right. It's usually like people get drunk and start talking and then a bouncer comes up and it's like, hey, can you be quiet? What? We're not allowed to laugh. I was just laughing. And it's like, no, you're being loud. It ruins the show. Then you kick him out and the crowd cheers. Get the F out of here. I don't want you guys to be a mob. Meets Cute, a romantic comedy movie starring Pete Davidson will hit Peacock. On Wednesday, September 21st, sorry, Pete, it's on Peacock, which means very few people will see it. 
Meet Cute follows the story of Sheila and Gary, Gary played by Pete Davidson. When they meet, it's love at first sight until we realize their magical date wasn't fate at all. Sheila's got a time machine and they've been falling in love over and over again. Maybe she's like 70 years old. The director said, if I had a time machine right now, I'd be torn. Do I skip ahead to our release date or do I go back and relive the joy it was making this film? Lucky for me, it's a decision I don't get to make. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of movies, the New York Post looked into my former co-worker Jamie Foxx. Whatever happened to Jamie Foxx's movie All-Star Weekend? Was it too provocative for cancel culture? In 2016, Jamie Foxx and Jeremy Piven started filming All-Star Weekend, a movie about two NBA-obsessed friends in Indiana. Piven's character is Steph Curry's biggest fan, while Foxx's worships LeBron. The pair win tickets to the NBA All-Star Weekend in L.A., and on their way out west, they run into a cast of wacky characters and find themselves in a dangerous situation with their hoop idols. All right, that sounds like fun. The cast included Robert Downey Jr. That will be important in a second. The movie was originally going to be released during the 2018 NBA All-Star Weekend, then was pushed to 2019. Then it never appeared. Last week, Jamie Foxx suggested the humor was too out of bounds for today's uptight comedy climate. He told Cinema Blend, it's been tough with the lay of the land when it comes to comedy. We're trying to break open the sensitive corners when people go back to laughing again. In the movie, Robert Downey Jr. plays a Mexican man and Fox plays a white racist cop. In 2017, Jamie Foxx was on Joe Rogan's podcast and said he never reads social media comments. If I read all the comments, I'd never tell another joke. I got a movie we just shot for a little or nothing called All Star Weekend. The jokes are all way out there. If you read the comments, that'll make you tuck that in. In the same interview, he defended Robert Downey Jr. for donning blackface in the 2008 Vietnam War satire Tropic Thunder and said he suggested Downey Jr. play a Mexican person in All-Star Weekend. I called Robert. I said, I need you to play a Mexican. Downey agreed, then got cold feet. Jamie said, you played the black dude and you killed that crap. We got to be able to do characters. Jeremy Piven suggests the delay isn't about the potentially offensive material, but Jamie Foxx's perfectionist streak. Piven was on a podcast in May and said, we did a movie with Jamie Foxx and Robert Downey Jr. And you'll never see it. Jamie doesn't want to release it. We'll see. Let's stop off at Gossip Corner from the New York Post. Kevin Hart was feeling generous after performing a show at the Barclays Center. He made the night of local, quote, famous homeless man, Julio, when he gave him $500 on his way to Herald Square's Jiggle Joint Sapphire 39. Apparently, Julio was telling jokes when Kevin Hart was walking by. Kevin liked the jokes enough that he handed over $500. Kevin arrived hand-in-hand with his wife and was, quote, in a great mood, taking pictures and chatting it up with everybody. In case you're unclear who was heading to the strip bar, Kevin Hart or the famous homeless man, it was Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart and the wife hit the strip club. Also there, young MC, who performed his 1989 hit, Bust a Move. The Post is told Hart brought his own Gran Carmino tequila. (laughs) There's always an angle to the bash and even gave free bottles to patrons at other tables. The comedian also spent over $10,000 throwing singles into the crowd and tipping the dancers. An insider says Hart closed the place down. Hey, check out the podcast Best Song Ever This Week. That's hosted by music journalist Scott Frampton. Every week in August, he's spotlighting 1982. 1982, not only a great year for film, a great year for movie. This week's best song ever this week is Come On Eileen by Dexy's Midnight Runners. Come on, you like that song? That is a great song. The best song ever this week, wherever you get your shows. I woke up this morning and I saw that Dan had bought me a large iced coffee. Thank you, Dan. It comes in handy. See, that sounds pretty full. This has like 10% lift. This is my usual large ice original cough for caramel swirl almonds milk. I was number 7339 this morning at the local donut chain. Thank you very much, Dan. Dan also left a note at buymeacoffee.com slash daily comedy news. His note says a priest, a cardinal and a rabbi walk into a bar. The bartender says, hey, what is this? Some sort of joke? (laughs) All right. Today is what podcast that I listen to that I can mention so I get cool SEO benefits. I was listening to Andrew Santino's podcast. Whiskey Ginger with Andrew Santino, and he was talking to Paul Veerzy about New York City and how they're kind of over it. 
and how the city isn't as good as it used to be. I grew up in Queens. I feel the same way. Around the turn of the century, the city had another little peak, but I feel like since then, it's kind of crowded and kind of noisy, and you go live somewhere else, and you're like, wow, this is better. So I really enjoyed that part of the conversation that Paul Vierzy and Andrew Santino had. So check out Whiskey Junior. That's today's SEO-friendly podcast recommendation. The rest of this podcast will be pretty serious, actually. Today is 818 Day, and this from the LA Times. Comedian Brody Stevens was found hanged on February 22nd, 2019, dead at age 48, and the impact on the comedy community was immediate. Comedy clubs and festivals across the country felt greater responsibility to promote mental health resources. The topic of depression shifted from onstage joke fodder to serious offstage conversation, Fellow comedians gathered for an informal 818 walk in Stevens' honor that August, named for the San Fernando Valley area code of his childhood that he would often reference in his self-depreciating bits. In 2021, 818 Day included the official dedication of an L.A. Parks Foundation memorial bench in Stevens' honor. Since 2019, Stevens' sister Stephanie Brody recalls, I lost count of the number of emails I received from people saying my brother was the first and sometimes only person who reached out and helped them when they were first starting out. We always knew my brother was a nurturing and kind person, but the stories we read took what we knew about him to a whole other level. Today at 8 o'clock, Brody Stevens' home club, The Comedy Store, will hold a special Brody Stevens 818-Day show, followed by Saturday's now annual Brody Stevens Festival of Friendship 818 Walk in Reseda. This year's event has partnered to benefit Comedy Gives Back, a charity aiding performers in need of mental health support and addiction retreatment. Zoe Friedman is one of the founders of Comedy Gives Back, and Zoe said Brody always exposed all sides of himself to the audience. If we don't talk about it, we perpetuate the stigma around it. The more we can talk about Brody and why we lost him, I believe and hope we can help others. Stevens described himself as a troubled kid. One of his jokes, I was touched, but not by an angel. The perp was supposed to get three years, but the judge gave him six. Why? Because I was molested in a construction zone. Stevens' sister Stephanie says Brody put a face on the disease and put it out there for all to see. He wanted people to see there isn't anything to be embarrassed or ashamed about. I see comedians talking more openly about their own mental illness struggles and how they've handled it. I see comedians being supportive of one another and being there for each other. I knew he'd be proud of the impact he's made, just as proud as our family is of him. The job of a comedian is to make people laugh. People presume if someone is funny, they must also be happy. That's not necessarily true. Struggles comedians experience are often masked by the sound of laughter. The comedy world is often overlooked when it comes to mental health awareness because of this. Opening up and talking about mental illness helps take the stigma away. I've noticed a gradual shift in that way of thinking, but our society needs to get to a place where mental illness isn't something to be ashamed of. I think we're headed in the right direction, but we still have a long way to go. I had slept this... uh, anecdote i saw from robin williams this was on yahoo robin quoted a saying for me comedy starts as a spew a kind of explosion then you sculpt it from there if at all it comes out of a deeper darker side maybe it comes from anger because i'm outraged by cruel absurdities the hypocrisy that exists everywhere even within yourself where it's hardest to see from the seattle times seattle comedian chris mejia has a bit about the time he felt suicidal and called the national suicide prevention lifeline it may not sound very funny but it gets laughs every time and after the show audience members often feel find Mejia and thank him for being so vulnerable on stage. He says, the more people share their experiences about difficult things, the more normalized it becomes when people come up to me. I can see by the looks on their faces they've gone through this or going through this, and they're relieved to know someone else is. Seattle comedian Andrew Frank describes long hours driving alone to faraway gigs, sleeping in their car, living paycheck to paycheck, late nights, low pay, lonely days in hotels. Some comics turn to alcohol and substances to cope or just to sleep. Frank says, you're in front of a whole crowd, your body's filling with all these endorphins and adrenaline, and then the show ends, and you're back in a hotel room in a place that you don't know. Comedian T. Murph says, in order to actually get up and do stand-up comedy, think about what that takes. It's literally a person going on stage in front of 10 to 10,000 people and talking about things that most people wouldn't feel comfortable talking about with a therapist. Comedy does, a lot of the time, come from a dark place. The things that we have to research, the things we have to express on stage in order to be able to get other people to laugh, it could take a toll on you. When I go on stage and do well, it's the highest high I could ever feel in my entire life. On the flip side, being on stage and bombing is the absolute lowest you could ever feel in your entire life. The 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is a U.S.-based suicide prevention network of over 160 crisis centers that provides 24-7 service via toll-free hotline with the number 988. 988 is available to anybody in suicidal crisis or emotional distress. 
That's your comedy news for today. I'll see you tomorrow.